what do you have to say for yourself, sibling? There's a rainbow as well. No, I know. I've seen it. Hello. Sorry for the slightly clickbaity title, um, but there wasn't much else I could call it. Uh, so this is going to be a sort of open-ended, several-part series about the origins of language, how language might have come about in the first place. And unfortunately, both within and outside of academia, this is the kind of topic that attracts a lot of just-so stories. So a lot of kind of, um, this would make sense, and this is in line with some of the evidence, so this is how I think it must have happened, stories. Whereas in reality, there are, there are probably, you know, more than a hundred different ways that language could potentially have arisen that make evolutionary sense but it's it's very hard to sort of sift through and pick out what's likely to be the right one. So in this series I'm going to sort of talk you through some of the evidence and we're not going to come to any solid conclusions because paleoanthropologists and linguists haven't come to any solid conclusions but we're just going to be sort of piecing bits of the issue together and sort of talking through the various evidence um, and I have, opinion, I have an opinion on some of the things that I will say in this series. So, for example, the, um, the debate about um, universal grammar and things like that. I have my own opinion about that kind of thing, which I'll try and make clear at the start of the video so that I'm not misleading people down the wrong sort of route. Um, but I'll try and be as unbiased as I, as I can. We'll start off by talking about how far back we can actually go with specific known languages. Um, and I've talked in the past about Proto-Indo-European, which is the sort of great-grandparent of the Indo-European language family. Uh, it's important to understand Proto-Indo-European is not the first language that ever existed. Not by a very long way. It's an easy mistake to make, but Proto-Indo-European would have had a, a, a long string of ancestors, a load of relatives spoken at the same time as it. There's a good chance it would have been a member of an older language family. Uh, we just don't know anything about that language family apart from the specifics of Proto-Indo-European. It, it was spoken about 5,000 years ago, and people have traced language families like Proto-Afroasiatic back uh, further than 5,000 years, but I don't know much about that, so I won't comment on the sort of um, the, the reliability of the dates on Proto-Afroasiatic. Um, but I think any mainstream paleoanthropologist would probably agree, um, go back 30,000 years beyond the last glacial maximum, people could produce the full range of sounds we can produce today, and they had the full range of cognitive abilities that we could have today. So... We don't know what any of their languages would have sounded like exactly, but they would have been the same kinds of languages as we have today, both phonologically and grammatically. And I think you can probably apply that statement further back still. I think you could probably apply that to 80,000 years ago, possibly further, bearing in mind anatomically modern humans have existed about 200,000 years. Another question that feeds into this is whether our close relatives can or could speak. Um, and that question is often asked about Neanderthals. And there are a couple of avenues of evidence about uh, Neanderthal linguistic ability. And the first of these is genetic. The Neanderthal genome contains a very similar but not identical version of the FOXP2 gene that we have. And that gene seems to be associated with speech, because when people are born with a faulty copy of it, they end up with speech disorders. But of course, you need more than just one gene to produce human-like language abilities. Um, and as for the rest of the Neanderthal genome, it's not clear whether they have the same, exactly the same genes coding for language-related things aside from FOXP2. Um, the, the other sorry, avenue of evidence comes from the hyoid bone, which is a sort of hovering bone. I think it's the only bone in the human body that's just kind of hovering in muscle and not actually attached to the skeleton. But the hyoid bone has a lot of muscle attachments for muscles in the vocal tract, so the tongue, the larynx, and things like that. And Neanderthals had, on a microscopic level, very similar hyoid bones to modern humans. Um, and these kinds of microscopic features of bones are often to do with muscle attachments or a result of people repeatedly using the muscles in the same way over time. So it could be that they were using the muscles of the vocal tract in the same way that modern humans do, and that that was having the same effect on the bones. So based on that, I, ten I tend to think that Neanderthals could produce speech on a similar level to us, but some people disagree with that. Um, so what about earlier hominins? Well, some research has been done into the linguistic abilities of Homo heidelbergensis, which is earlier, um, occurs earlier than humans, modern humans or Neanderthals. Um, and there's some suggestion that they were, they were at least predisposed to some aspects of language. So one thing we sometimes don't think of in terms of language is that your hearing apparatus is just as important as your speaking apparatus. There's no point being able to produce a load of different speech sounds if your ears can't tell them apart. So I'll put a study in the description 
from the site of Atapuerca, which, uh, which suggests sorry, that Heidelbergensis had ears that were about as sensitive as modern human ears. Um, and for reference, chimpanzees, gorillas, don't have that level of aud auditory sensitivity. Uh, and I'll also link to another study that suggests Heidelbergensis probably had left and right-handedness, which again doesn't really exist in chimpanzees, and that's a sign of brain lateralisation, which has also been connected to language use, although that's a slightly more tenuous link, I should say, that's not the main point of the article. A lot of arguments, academic arguments as well, in favour of early hominin speech ability come from the idea they couldn't have done certain complicated things without being able to speak. So they couldn't have hunted in big coordinated groups without being able to shout at each other or plan. Um, they wouldn't have been able to uh, teach their children certain stone tool industries like the Valois without being able to explain it to them verbally or at least using sign language or some kind of grammatical language. Um, just the idea they wouldn't have been able to do the things that we know they did without speech or at least without some kind of grammatical language. I think we should be a bit sceptical of these arguments because they sort of a appeal to our sense of intuition, but they, they don't ne they're not necessarily very convincing. So why couldn't a person learn the Lavalois stone tool industry without speaking? I, I think there's actually been a study done that's shown people can actually learn it in silence, but I'll have to, I'll have to put a thing up on screen saying whether that's actually true or not. Um, and in terms of hunting, I think a very strong knowledge of local geography combined with childhood experience of watching hunts take place, could absolutely bring you to the point that you could coordinate a hunt without anything more than the kind of sign communications that chimpanzees use, not even grammatical sign language. Um, and importantly, that is only my intuition, so that's no better an argument. But my point is, if you're arguing on the basis of that kind of sort of flimsy intuition, it, it's just going to devolve into, yes, they could, no, they couldn't, you know. Uh, although having said that, to add to the the flint napping thing, Neanderthal neurology is very badly understood, so it might just be, for all we know, it might just be that they had better procedural memory than us and they were better at watching and learning or something like that, you know. Um, so these, these arguments from intuition often come not only from intuition, but from modern human intuition or from modern sort of Western intuition. So they're, they're really not, not often applicable to such a vastly different biological and cultural situation that we're, that we're talking about in terms of early hominins. Another thing is that the mechanical apparatus for speaking is not enough to say that a species had language. So take a modern species of monkey, um, like the gilada, for example. It can pr produce a similar range of speech sounds to humans, but as far as we can tell, they don't have words, they don't have syntax, uh, they can't communicate about the kinds of concepts that we can communicate about. All that stuff has nothing to do with the vocal tract, it, it, it's, it's to do with the brain. And unfortunately the brain preserves less well than the vocal tract in the fossil record. So what actually are the concrete ways that language is different from animal communication? Well one thing we seem to have is grammar, sort of syntax. That is, we don't just have words, but we also have rules about how to use those words together to express a specific meaning. So chimpanzees seem to be able to communicate using what are basically words, just in gesture form. So there might be a gesture for come and groom me, there might be a gesture for I submit, there might be a gesture for let's play a game. But as far as we know, and bear in mind this is a fast moving field, which I'll talk more about in the next video. But as far as we know, a chimpanzee couldn't say something like he submitted and then came and groomed me. Or when I submit to someone, I go and groom them. Or we're playing a game, then we, when we're finished, we can groom each other. So grammar allows us to do a few things. It allows us to talk about specific people and things, uh, even when they're not around us. It allows us to talk about the order that things happened in. It allows us to talk about things that are ongoing, things that started in the past and will finish in the future. It allows us to express that something may or may not happen. So, for example, in the sentence, if you go to the shop, get me some milk, that's acknowledging that the listener may or may not go to the shop. Another important feature of human language is symbolism. Um, and symbolism is something we use on many levels. And what I mean by symbolism is using one thing to represent another thing. And perhaps most importantly, the symbol does not have to actually bear any resemblance to the thing it represents. So I'll show you what I mean through an example. One of these objects is a yazduk, uh, and I'll give you a minute to guess which one it is. Anybody who speaks Serbian might recognise it as meaning this, uh, assuming I pronounced it vaguely right, which I might not have done. Um, but there's nothing about the word yastuk that enables you to work out what it means. You just have to know. Uh, and the same is true of the English word cushion. There's nothing about the word cushion that actually resembles this object. The word cushion is just a symbol. 
and we agree amongst ourselves that this symbol represents this object even though the sequence of sounds has nothing intrinsically connecting it to this object. We need to be able to talk about cushions somehow, so we just agree this sequence of sounds means this, and that is symbolism. Most words in most languages are just symbols representing something. So a counterexample of that would be onomatopoeia, so a word that actually sounds like the thing it's describing, like bang. But those words are pretty few and far between. Although it seems like other animals might be capable of something like symbolic thought. So you could, yeah, you could just argue that symbolic thought is an extension of the ability to associate things with each other, which is something that you know a lot of animals can do. So, for example, in Pavlov's dog experiment, he trained dogs to associate the ringing of a bell with food, even though the ringing of a bell uh, doesn't actually resemble food. So could you not just say that in a rudimentary way, the dog saw the ringing of the bell as a symbol representing, uh, representing food? So broadly speaking, how is that any different from us hearing the, you know, this sequence of sounds and associating it with food? Um, of course, there is a difference. We can slot the word food into a number of different contexts and use it to express an unlimited number of different ideas which a dog can't do. But in my opinion, the symbolism thing isn't quite such a big leap to make as grammar. So the question then becomes, um, at what point did we start using grammar and how did it come about and why did it come about? And that's actually the source of one of the biggest debates in linguistics. Um, so I'll save that for another video when I have more time to discuss it. Um, that was very introductory, but hopefully it's kind of set the, set the scene for future videos on the topic. Um, the next video I do will probably be, um, just because it's been requested a few times, just me pronouncing various common words in Old English. Um, so if you have any specific requests for words you'd like to hear, then just put them in the comments and I'll try and get round to as many as I can. Um, I'll mostly be using a sort of textbook late West Saxon dialect, but if there's any specific reason to use uh, a different dialect, then I'll, I'll try and include that as well. So thank you very much for watching, and I will see you soon.